Hello, and welcome to our webcast. I'm Amy Pendergrass with Moss Adams, and I'm going to get us started for today's session, Architecture, Engineering, and Construction Tax Incentives. We're pleased that you've joined us today. And before we begin, I'm going to play our brief housekeeping video. Welcome, and thanks for joining. We're pleased to present our continuing professional education webcast series. Before we begin, please keep the following in mind. You can customize how you view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top right of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons that relate to a different aspect of our session. You can download a PDF of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget. You can ask questions by typing in the Q&A window and clicking Submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session offers one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy requirements. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of polling questions. To participate in the polls, please check the button next to your answer within the slide window and click Submit. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget and download your CPE certificate. Don't worry if you can't download your CPE certificate today. We'll email you a copy in two weeks. If attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our Group CPE Attendance Sheet, available in our slide deck and handouts widget to receive credit. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. CPE credit can only be awarded to participants registered as themselves and isn't available for participants who view the on-demand version. This presentation is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. All right, and now I would like to introduce today's presenters from Moss Adams, all of which have a focus on tax credits and incentives. We have Kyle Sun, Senior Manager, Josh Jure, uh, Senior Manager, and Matt Lord, Manager. Their bios and contact information are located in your webcast console for your convenience. And now I would like to turn the floor over to Kyle to get the presentation started. Kyle? Yeah. Thanks, Amy, and yeah, thanks everybody for joining today. Uh, this is going to be a really uh, great presentation, and you know, hopefully, um, you know, really relevant to you know your companies uh, that are in the architecture, engineering, and construction space. You know, we're we're really focusing on two major tax incentives: the Section 179D Energy Efficient Commercial Building Deduction, and then also the R and D tax credit and the changes. Um, you know, that recently came into effect over the last few months and, you know, really how to how to navigate those and potentially for, you know, those companies that uh, that are considered designers can actually, you know, maybe use 179D to mitigate some of the some of the changes that we've seen with the R&D tax credit recently. We're going to jump right into a polling question. Uh, so the polling question that we have for uh, to lead us off is, has your firm utilized the Section 179D deduction in the past? So we have A, yes, we've been using 179D successfully. B, yes, but believe there may be additional 179D opportunities that we've missed out on. C, no, our projects have not been eligible to pursue 179D. Or D, this is not something that we've considered previously. And we'll give folks a little bit to answer this first polling question. I know it's always <laughs> it's always uh, new when you see that that polling question pop up, and I want to give folks some time to, to navigate that, how to answer it. All right, it looks like most have responded. For those of you trying to figure out how to submit, you're just gonna click the button uh, that you choose and then hit the submit button. If you can't see that button, just enlarge your slide area. 
We'll give it another five seconds here. All right, Kyle, here are the results. Yeah, so th this is a pretty good mix of, of answers. Um, looks like we had a little less than half that answered yes, um, and then about 20% that answered no, we, uh, we've not been eligible, eligible to pursue 170 ID, and then 37%, so uh, about um, not something that they've considered previously. So yeah, good mix of answers, and you know, I know for some of you that have been taking advantage of 179D already or have looked into it already, you know, this, this may be, um, you know, a little bit of a um, refresher, you know, regarding 179D because it's been around for, um, you know, a, a number of years, really since 2006. Um, that's what we have on the slide here. That Everything on the slide here is pre-Inflation Reduction Act, which was a bill that was signed uh, in August of, of last summer. And so everything we have on the slide here is is basically getting us up to the point through December 31st, 2022, in regards to the Section 179D Energy Efficient Commercial Ability Deduction. So prior to the IRA bill, the deduction was up to $1.88 per square foot of building area. And it was, uh, there were inflation adjustments that have been applied. There were, the deduction was $1.80 per square foot for a number of years. And as you can see that it was adjusted up for inflation uh, over those those prior two years or those last two years in, in the, the old law. Uh, the deductions available for uh, newly constructed buildings or you know large scale building improvement projects. Uh, again, if they've been placed in service after January 1st, 2006. And, and really the, the unique aspect of 179D is that both building owners and designers can take advantage of the deduction. So you know this would include, of course, owners and tenants of commercial properties, uh, also owners of four-story or greater residential buildings. Uh, that, that hasn't changed at all, but um, you know, the unique aspect and, and why it's relevant to, you know, to this group here today is that designers of, of government-owned energy-efficient buildings, you know, which you know, typically would be the architecture, engineering, and, and contractors that are, that are doing design work, they can also take adva advantage of uh, Section 179D. So now, now we're getting into the changes as a part of the Inflation Reduction Act. So the way that we've split up these sides is everything on the left side, of course, is, is the Pre-Inflation Reduction Act law, which again was through December 31st, 2022. Then everything on the right side of the screen for these next handful of slides is uh, going to be the, the updates that we've seen with the Inflation Reduction Act. And, and you know, as I mentioned on the previous slide, through December 31st, 2022, designers of, of government owned buildings um, could take advantage of Section 170 ID provided those entities uh, did design work for those for those improvements. You know, really one of the big changes with the Inflation Reduction Act is that that definition of who a, a designer is and who those deductions can be allocated to has expanded. And, and really what's relevant to this group here today is that designers of buildings that are owned also by uh, nonprofit and tax exempt organizations, tribal organizations, uh, churches, religious organizations, kind of everything that falls into that tax exempt nonprofit bucket, designers of those buildings can now take advantage of 179D. You know, another major change to, to 179D with the Inflation Reduction Act is the dollar amount uh, per square foot of the deduction has changed. So, as I previously mentioned, the deduction was up to a dollar and 88 cent per square foot through December 31st, 2022. And with the Inflation Reduction Act, there's now two different sets of deductions. So there's a base deduction, and we'll get into the base deduction and the bonus deduction piece a bit later, but for, uh, for the purposes of the dollar per square foot, the base deduction is on a sliding scale. It's up to 50 cents per square foot, all the way up to a dollar per square foot, and that's if the energy savings are between 25 and 50% when measuring against uh, the ASHRAE standards that Matt will talk about in a, in a little bit. You know, and then the bonus deduction is $2.50 per square foot for energy savings of 25%, again, on a sliding scale up to $5 a square foot. And this is, you know, where we've seen, of course, a lot of interest, the dollar amount 
has not quite tripled <laughs> potentially, but it's gone up significantly. Um, so there's a lot more interest in Section 170 ND and what this deduction means. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Matt to talk about a few other changes uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act. Great. Thanks, Kyle. So the IRA also changed something referred to as the deduction cap. Uh, effectively, since 2006, there has been a, a lifetime cap of available 17090 deductions, equivalent to $1.80 per square foot. And once this has been claimed, even if you make additional energy efficient upgrades in your building since taking it previously, you were unable to take advantage of 17090 again. Now, uh, there is a three year cap available. For a building that allows you to take further 17090 deductions as long as the previous full deduction claim occurred more than three taxable years ago. And this is going to have uh, significant ramifications for designers, especially for government facilities like schools. School renovations are often phased and likely several have occurred for many buildings since 2006 when 17090 was made, uh, was created. And these projects would now be reopened for future 17090 studies. Now I want to touch on what we are comparing against when we measure energy efficiency. After 17090 was made permanent at the end of 2020, and again when it was modified as part of the Inflation Reduction Act, a rolling efficiency mechanism was introduced uh, to raise the minimum efficiency standards. And there was some ambiguity in exactly which ASHRAE 90.1 standard that was to be used, but at the end of 2022, the Department of Energy and Treasury issued guidance to affirm the proper standard. On your screen, you can see that the proper standard that should be applied is based on when the building is placed in service. And what this shows is for all projects complete from now until the end of 2026, the 90.1 standard we're measuring against is from 2007. And this represents good news for those looking to claim 17090 as buildings being designed and built today are often being built to codes and standards far exceeding the efficiency requirements present in version 2007. You may be wondering why is the 2007 standard still being used? Uh, and to me, it just really shows that 17090 is meant to be an attainable target while also continuing to promote energy efficiency, especially on this rolling basis. And that's going to jump significantly in 2027 to using the 2019 ASHRAE standard. Another technical change that was made as part of the Inflation Reduction Act was the introduction of a new alternate qualification path for retrofit projects. Historically, uh, the energy cost savings evaluated for building being studied for 17090 was done using energy model, using ASHRAE 90.1 methodology that we touched on on previous slide. That same energy modeling methodology exists and will continue to be used for all new construction and many renovation projects. But now this new path exists to evaluate energy savings based on actual measured energy use intensity. And this method will be based on actual measured energy savings before and after the project and requires validation of the actual energy savings realized by the project that is measured at least one year after when the new energy efficient equipment was installed. Now, there are still a number of questions on how exactly this methodology will be put into practice. Uh, the IRS has already solicited comments from the public and is working on issuing guidance on the specifics of this program, so stay tuned for that. But what I can say is this option may be more suited to those working in an energy services or ESCO type role on retrofit projects so there's some sort of contractual performance piece or measurement and verification process. And one last note on this is that it requires a qualified retrofit plan to be put together by a licensed architect or engineer who they deem to be a qualified professional. And this differs from the certification and field inspection requirements already in place, which is for a qualified individual uh, who is a licensed PE or contractor in the state where the building is located. So that, that'll be a key distinction as we learn more about this new alternate path. 
Now we're going to discuss how do we qualify for this uh, significantly higher deduction rate of $5 a square foot. And this deduction, higher deduction rate, which we have termed the bonus deduction, is available when local prevailing wage and apprenticeship labor hour requirements are met. And we're going to dive into the details of those additional requirements on the next slide. But it is important to note that you will not be held to these new requirements so long as construction began prior to January 30th, 2023. Projects that started before this day are automatically eligible for the higher deduction rate for up to $5 per square foot. And the way that this really critical start of construction date is determined is based on two different tests. One is the physical work test, and the other is the 5% safe harbor test. The first set of requirements relates to paying prevailing wages for any laborer employed on a project, which includes contractors and subcontractors. The Secretary of Labor has published online a website that details these prevailing wage determinations, and what they are for various geographic locations, as well as types of work. So for those of you who have done work on public jobs or work in more union-oriented environments, you will already be familiar with these requirements because they're commonly referred to as Davis-Bacon wages. And in order to comply with these new prevailing wage requirements, sufficient records must be kept showing that these laborers and mechanics have been paid wages above these established rates. In the event that the prevailing wage information is not available online for a specific location or for a type of worker, uh, the taxpayer may request the Department of Labor provide this prevailing wage information. And then a similar vein to the uh, prevailing wage requirements, there are now requirements associated with the number of hours on a construction project worked by qualified apprentices. A qualified apprentice means an individual who is employed by a taxpayer or by any contractor or subcontractor and who is participating in a registered apprenticeship program. These registered apprenticeship programs can be found online through an apprenticeship.gov website. And based on when construction or project started, which is judged based on that physical work test or 5% safe harbor test that we mentioned previously, the percentage of total labor hours performed by qualified apprentices runs from 10% up to 15% for projects beginning construction in 2024 and beyond. And one additional item of note as it relates to meeting this apprenticeship requirement, there is a good faith exception. And effectively, if the taxpayer has requested qualified apprentices from a registered apprenticeship program and the request is either denied or the registered apprenticeship program fails to respond within five business days after submitting the request, then a taxpayer is deemed to have satisfied the apprenticeship requirements. Now, with both the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements, there are a number of interesting questions that have come up around how is this going to apply to different parties, especially as it relates to designers. Specifically for architects and engineers, there is some concern as to the fact that these firms typically do not control or influence what contractors or subcontractors are paid on a project. Additionally, there are questions around how to satisfy the record keeping requirements for all laborers on a project, as that information is typically not shared by the contractors themselves other than perhaps to the owner. And so with all that said, there are certainly still details to be ironed out and the potential for additional guidance to come out from the IRS. Now, these prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements do not simply apply to 179D. They were applied across the board to numerous energy incentives that were modified as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. So as the dust settles and, and more guidance is issued, we hope to have more clarity on the situation. But in the meantime, uh, most large projects complete in calendar year 2023 will have started construction prior to this guidance taking effect. So that higher deduction rate will be available immediately to many taxpayers. Now this slide just shows some examples demonstrating the magnitude of the available deduction before and after the Inflation Reduction Act. 
Those post-IRA deduction maximum values are based on meeting the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements or being exempt from them based on the construction start date of the project. If those labor requirements are not met and you're out of that exempt period, the maximum value drops by a factor of five. And one additional note is that the total claimed 17090 deduction cannot exceed the total capitalized cost of the energy efficient property placed into service. Now that we have covered 179D and the recent modifications to it, I wanted to cover the process of how you claim a 179D deduction on your tax return. And the first step uh, when evaluating whether to claim 179D as a designer is to ensure that you are in fact meeting the tax code definition of a designer, which is defined as someone who creates technical specifications for the installation of energy efficient commercial building property. Once that criteria has been met, the next step is to receive a signed allocation letter from the allocating entity formally assigning the 17090 deduction to you. This is a critical step as the amount of available deduction is limited by the total square footage multiplied by the relevant deduction rate, which is dependent on the tax year. And once this full amount has been claimed by an eligible designer, no additional 17090 claims can be made on the project until new work is done at least three taxable years later. And so this means there is a level of urgency required when securing allocation letters for projects where you are a designer, as in many cases, the first eligible firm to ask is the one that receives the allocation. Now, there's also the potential to share the allocation among several designers should that setup be the preferred route for you and your firm. Now, once you have that signed allocation letter, a third-party firm like Moss Adams will construct an energy model and perform a site visit of the facility with a licensed professional engineer in the state where the building is located. A certification and a report will then be issued to you, and then you claim the deduction under the other deductions category while also filing a new form 7205 with your return, which we're going to discuss here in a moment. Now, as a designer, a 17090 deduction must be claimed in the tax year when the building is placed in service. For projects completed in prior tax years that your firm may be looking at to perform a 17090 study, an amended tax return would be required to claim the deduction. So previously, a 17090 deduction was claimed simply under other deductions on a tax return. The IRS in the last few weeks has put out this new form 7205, which must be filed for all future 179D claims made on tax returns. So this is a four part, one page form, which provides summary level details of the buildings being claimed, energy savings rates, qualified individual certifying the study, and the representative information of the representative of the building owner who authorized the allocation. And this information on this form doesn't require any new analysis as each of these fields reflects details that should already be determined as part of a compliant 17090 study. What this form does suggest is there's going to be additional scrutiny around 17090 claims being made. It is also likely that this form is going to undergo revisions, especially as we move into tax year 2023 with the new prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements as the current version doesn't appear to support providing this labor related information. So now I believe we have another polling question. So if Amy, you could get that opened up. That would be great. All right, thank you. So the second polling question is all of the following entities can allocate the Section 179D deduction to a designer for projects placed in service after January 1st, 2023, except for government entities, private commercial owners, not-for-profit organizations, or tribal organizations. And then also just a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE uh, credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions.
All right, we'll give it a few more seconds. If you don't know the answer, you still get credit if you select the wrong one. Here you go. All right. So leading contender, private commercial owners, that is the correct answer. So private commercial owners can take 17090 themselves, so they can't allocate it. Uh, but those other three categories are now eligible for those projects to be allocated to eligible designers. So lots of potential new opportunities. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Josh to talk through some of the R&D tax credit changes. Great, thanks, Matt. Uh, my name is Josh Dre, and I've worked in the research and development tax group here at Moss Adams for the, uh, about nine years now. And today I wanted to talk to you about two specific topics. One, the R&D tax credit uh, itself, and then also a, a new, it's called 174 R&E expense calculation, which is a, a new requirement that the IRS has put in place in, for tax periods 2022. So if we move to the next slide here, it's uh, 174 R&E uh, research and experimentation expenses, uh, or sometimes they're called research and development expenses. In tax year 2022, you're required to capitalize these costs at the federal level. <clears throat> so if you see here, so starting uh, in 2022, you have to capitalize all expenses that are related to research and development costs, and then you have to amortize them, slowly expense them uh, over a five-year period if they are domestic. And if it's research and experimentation costs that are foreign, it's a 15-year amortization period. And this is a requirement that all taxpayers are going to have to consider for their 2022 federal tax filings. <clears throat> so the, the next question is, uh, is, how is a research and development cost uh, identified? And really, it's, it's any expense that's kind of in the design, experimental uh, type realm, and, and, and then it also is any costs that are uh, related to the development of a product or improvement of a product. <clears throat> and the IRS is, is planning to issue additional guidance around this particular topic, and the most recent article has said that they're going to provide taxpayers with additional guidance by the end of this year. But for now, we just have to look at kind of the plain definition of what, you know, incident means. And so I, I just pulled a couple different uh, definitions here, but really it's, it's, it's any costs that are uh, kind of incurred because of a particular design or research and development activity. And this, this next slide here talks about the particular states that don't conform to this new rule. So I think it's important to understand that the capitalization and amortization of R&D expenses is required at a federal level, but and, and most states require uh, it as well. But you'll see here there's six states. I, I pulled this list uh, as of March 11th, so there's six states here that, that don't conform so if you have a filing requirement in one of these states, there may be an adjustment from your federal taxable income to the state taxable income. We move forward here. I'll turn it over to Amy for the third polling question. All right, thank you. The third polling question is, Starting in which uh, filing tax year do taxpayers have to consider if they have research and experimental expenditures required to be capitalized and amortized? 2021, 2022, 2023, or 2027? And then also for those of you that would like a copy of today's slides, you can download them from the folder that says slide deck and handouts. And then we're also sending them via email tomorrow along with the recording of this webcast.
We'll leave it up another five seconds. All right, here you go. Thank you. So yeah, not a little bit of a split, but it's 2022. Um, so uh, when you're thinking about filing your federal tax return this year, we need to consider if your company has any research and experimental expenses. Mm -hmm. There are some other considerations to think about when we're calculating this new special bucket of tax expenses. For construction companies specifically, uh, there's some interesting interactions that occur related to the percentage of completion revenue recognition uh, on long-term contracts. And, and the IRS has also mentioned that they're going to come out with additional guidance later this year to kind of address this particular issue. But if you if your company is doing design build type activities uh the, there could be a situation in which the percentage of the completion accounting method could uh, slow the revenue recognition mm -hmm. uh, a couple other situations to think about is you know usually the research and experimental expenses aren't broken out into their Specific, into a specific account. And when, we, when we're working to calculate these research and uh, experimental expenses, we have to look across uh, a variety of GL accounts and pull all the costs that kind of relate to research and development activities. Mm -hmm. uh, it could also include indirect costs. And, and there could be subcontractor costs in this bucket, and there could also be uh, costs related to foreign activities. Unlike the, and what, we'll get into this a little bit later in the, in the slide deck, but unlike the R&D tax credit, which is focused on domestic research and development expenses, this new 174 required calculation also requires us to look at any foreign activities. So the next portion is looking at uh, the research and development tax credit. The research and development tax credit is an elective option for taxpayers, unlike the 174, which is required. But if companies are thinking about, you know, thinking about, hey, we, we have these 174 expenses, uh, then it, then it may it may be beneficial to also look to see if you can claim a research and development tax credit, which can help offset some of the tax impact that this new 174 requirement kind of um, has for various taxpayers. So the, the research and development tax credit is a dollar for dollar reduction of federal tax and you know, for every dollar found that is pushed into the bucket of research and development, you could roughly see a five to 10% uh, credit that offsets federal taxes paid. But in addition to that, there could also be significant state tax savings. So there are over 30, there's 38 states that also offer some form of a research and development tax credit. So we could not only layer the, the federal tax credit, but also a state tax credit. And that's what this particular slide, again, I, I pulled this information uh, as of a couple weeks ago, but there are 38 states that also offer R&D tax credits. So you could get an R&D tax credit at a federal level as well as the state level for the dollars spent. Now, how do we define what a research and development activity is? Well, the IRS gives us this four-part test to determine if something is considered research and development. And, and the first portion is a qualified purpose. 
So what this means is that you have to be developing a product, a process. Uh, could be, it could be a software um, activity. It could be an invention, a formula. And it could be something that you're either developing internally or it could be something that you're developing uh, for a customer. And it can be something brand new that you as a business or a taxpayer has never done before. Uh, or you could be making improvements to something that's already in existence. Maybe you've built it before, you've designed it before, but there's a unique challenge, a unique, a unique site condition uh, to where there is some technical uncertainty around that activity. And that's what the second portion of this test is involved, is at the onset of a project, there has to be technical uncertainty. <clears throat> So when you're thinking about maybe like a design-build contract, you know, there's computer modeling, 3D, you know, 3D BIM modeling, things that you have to do, or maybe there's a, a, a unique construction process that you have to develop, and there's uncertainty at the beginning. You're you're unsure if it's going to work, but you're hopeful. But you know, you might just have to go out and actually try it to see if it's going to work. <clears throat> And the technical uncertainty piece is really what we need to look at to determine if something is considered a research and experimental expense. So, you know, earlier when I was talking about how we have to kind of identify those expenses so that we can properly capitalize them and amortize them this year, that's the piece that the IR, you know, that we need to understand that the IRS is looking for is is there activities that have that technical uncertainty factor? Mm. And then part three of this test says that there has to be a process of experimentation involved to try and eliminate the technical uncertainty. You know, you're, you're looking at different alternatives, you know, you're modeling out the, the design, clash detection, you're, you're trying to put together calculations, simulations, or models to, to eliminate the uncertainty before you actually go uh, build something. And it could be either from like a computer modeling standpoint, or it could be real world mock-ups and, and, and testing. So again, it's all around an experimentation process to eliminate the uncertainty, to be able to successfully build the project successfully create a design that's going to work. And, and at the end of the day, you know, the, the customer's happy or internally you've developed something that now you can take into the marketplace. And then the fourth portion of this four part test is it has to be technological in nature, which means that it has to relate to some sort of hard science. So we're looking at mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, is there, you know, material science involved, chemistry, structural engineering. It, we, we have to point it back to some sort of hard science activity. That could also include uh, computer science as well. <clears throat> so if it's more related to like look, feel, or color, that doesn't necessarily fall into the bucket. It's, it's more of, you know, a hard science. On to the next slide. So what are some of the, what are the activities and the types of expenses that can qualify for a research and development credit? <clears throat> so the first one is a, a qualified wage. So for in-house employees that are performing these design engineering related activities, those costs can get pulled into the bucket of a research and development expense. Maybe you're on site and you're building uh, a mock-up or a prototype, or you have a complex means and methods of construction that requires you to actually go build a portion or maybe build an entire system or an entire building. And that's when we can qualify some of the supply costs associated with those activities. 
And so if there's if there's concern at the onset of a build where you're, uh, you know we might have to tear this out, we might have to we might have to start over. We don't know if it's going to work the way we're intending it to. That's when we can pick up some of the supply costs and, and pull that into the credit calculation as well. I mentioned I, I put on this slide the qualified computer leasing expenses. That's more that's more related to software development. <clears throat> which if your company is performing any type of software development activity, that type of activity automatically qualifies as a 174 expense and has to be capitalized and amortized. It's not something that I usually see in the industry, but I think it's important to consider, especially for 2022. And then the, the fourth expense that can qualify for the R&D credit is qualified contract research. So maybe you don't, it's not your in-house employees that are performing the research and development. You're hiring a subcontractor, a third party to perform design activities on your behalf, to perform a portion of the build that's more complex. Uh, those types of activities can qualify for the credit as well. And they, they may, they are gonna also potentially fall into the, the 174 bucket. So there's a, there's a lot of costs that need to be considered across the board to both determine the, the 174 expenses as well as the R&D expenses. Let's move on to the next slide. So what are some of the types of activities that could potentially be research and development? Maybe you're designing a process, uh, a technique, you're trying to increase the overall efficiency of a build, the quality of the end product or, or the performance. Maybe, maybe you're working on a design build contract that, that has you know, innovative concepts, you know, innovative components, that could qualify. Maybe there's projects where you're doing extensive engineering efforts or you're hiring a third party that's performing engineering efforts on your behalf. They're doing AutoCAD, BIM, BIM modeling. Maybe there's crash detection considerations between trades. There's prototyping involved on a project. There, there, there's modeling. Maybe there's a, a kind of a trial and error process where you have to go build a portion of an activity in the field and, and see if it's gonna work appropriately. Are you, are you developing or building specialized machinery or tooling? Um, is there any like intellectual property rights or patents that your company is trying to, to, to design and, and, and then use that going forward? Does, does your company have any engineers on staff uh, or, or product development type departments? These are kind of some of the initial questions that I would be thinking about to see if both does the company have the research and experimental expenses that have to be capitalized, as well as does any of those expenses uh, qualify for the R&D tax credit? Mm -hmm. So this particular slide is more specific to architectural and engineering firms, right? You're designing, you have new or innovative designs for a structure. Uh, you're, you're evaluating various subcomponents, methods, or, or different materials that could be used in the construction process. Maybe you're developing a building that has innovative lead or energy efficiencies or, or green systems. <clears throat> Uh, you, you know, you're considering some soil, subterranean conditions, uh, foundation design, shoring. And then, you know, you, you can see here a lot of the things that we're talking about that relate to 179D also relate both to the 174 and the R&D credit under Section 41. Uh, they can be very intertwined, all of the activities. <clears throat> Or maybe there's maybe there's designs related to the electrical system or the HVAC system of the building, uh, or just the building envelope system itself. 
again, patents, uh, engineering departments. Then, and then this particular slide is more geared towards the constru you know, construction side of things. Are you building an are you building these systems an energy efficient feature? Um, are you building a treatment, a water treatment, wastewater treatment plant? And, and you know, have you had to build a, a bridge or road structures that are innovative? And, and those take a lot of engineering. Mm -hmm. Um, is there foundation shoring work that has to occur because of the unique site condition? Where, where are you located? Maybe you're developing a new construction technique. Um, it could be related to a mechanical or electrical system. You know, maybe there's a temporary system that you have to build uh, for, from the false work or form work. Is there, is there dewatering on a particular site that you have to take into consideration? And then, again, we're looking, you know, foundations, structural members of the building, or, or the building envelope. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think this is probably the most important slide to, to consider is this particular slide is showing you the difference between what could be qualified for the R&D tax credit and, and what could be considered a 174 research and experimentation expense that has to be capitalized and amortized. And again, I, I want to reiterate that the 174 expense bucket is a required consideration for tax year 2022. Taxpayers need to be thinking, do, 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 we ha do I have these expenses? And, you know, is it something that we need to pull into its own separate bucket. And if you do have the 174 expenses, then you can also potentially claim an R&D tax credit, which is a little bit of a smaller circle because not everything qualifies for the R&D tax credit that will qualify for 174. But being able to take the R&D tax credit can kind of help, help offset the initial tax impact that the 174 capitalization requirements um, have for taxpayers in 2022. I think uh, we will move on to the fourth polling question. All right, thank you. So our last polling question is, has your company considered identifying both research and experimental expenditures and research and development tax credits? A, yes, currently taking the R&D tax credit and identifying R&E expenses. Uh, B, no, but it is something we would like to learn more about. C, no, this is not something we have considered in the past. Or D, I don't think my company has any research and development related activities in 2022. And then once you've completed all CPE requirements, you will be able to download a PDF of your certificate uh, from the CPE progress window. And while folks are answering this question, um, Josh, there's probably a lot of people that are <laughs> that are either thinking this question, and I, I've seen a couple of these questions pop in. But what what's your thoughts on this possibly being repealed, or just kind of what sort of activity have we seen, uh, you know, with Congress and and you know the potential for this potentially changing back to how it was previously. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, over the past year, Congress has tried to repeal this particular uh, 174 capitalization rule. There was a there was a version of the Build Back Better plan that did not pass. There was a version of the omnibus bill that did not pass that was either trying to completely remove this particular rule or uh, kick the can down the road you know, to 2026. Mm -hmm. uh, most recently, over the past couple of weeks, uh, an article in CNN that I, that I read was talking about how Congress understands this is uh, a, an issue for taxpayers. And 
you know, one side of Congress says, hey, we want to remove this particular 174 rule. And the other side is asking for other considerations. And they both need to agree. And so that hasn't happened yet. But, you know, maybe in the middle of this year, they could come to an agreement. But unfortunately, right now, we we have to work under the assumption that this is the tax law, and we and we have to follow kind of w- what it says for 2022. And if if it does change, then you know taxpayers will you know have to they're going to have to amend tax returns. Or uh, if you put a if you put a extension in place, uh, you could file what's called a, a superseded tax return and replace the original return. Because there has been talks from Congress saying that they are going to retroactively change this rule, but nothing, nothing has been done thus far. All right, I'm going to pull up the polling results here. Well, it looks like we have quite a few individuals in the audience that have been taking the R&D tax credit and are looking to identify their R&E expenses for this year, which is great. Um, and then, you know, if, if you have questions about this at the end of the presentation, about anything that either I've discussed or Kyle or Matt has discussed, you know, feel free to reach out to us. So a couple other considerations to think about when claiming the R&D tax credit. The the, the R&D tax credit is a non-refundable tax credit. So what that means is that you you have to be in a taxable position to use the credit benefit. So one of the things that I would I would help evaluate is determining if you can use the credit in the current year. And then also, even if you can't use the credit, at a federal level, at a federal level, the credit carries forward. It carries back one year and forward for 20. So even if the company can't use it immediately, you know, if, if you will be able to use it at some point in the future. <laughs> and then the other piece is to think about, and we didn't have a whole lot of time to touch on this, but there's some additional considerations about which party has the financial risk and the rights, uh, the intellectual property rights in the activities that are being developed. So that is an additional consideration that we would want to think about. But, but at the end of the day, it's a, it's a permanent tax savings. And so you claim the credit and you, you won't have to, you won't, you're avoiding taxes that you would have to pay otherwise. I think this last slide here is talking about how we can offset the R&D capitalization with 179D. So this is kind of a projection from 2022 all the way to 2027. So in this particular example, the business had $1.7 million of 174 expenses. And in 2022, you can only tax expense 170,000, 10%, which means that you'll carry forward about $1.5 million into future tax years that will eventually get used. <laughs> so because of this new 174 rule, you, you, may, you may be looking you know, at a 30% tax rate, you may be looking at over $460,000 of tax due and then you can kind of use these two options that we discussed today today to help mitigate that tax impact. So the first one is the R&D tax credit. You know, you're going to identify almost $1.2 million in this example of R&D, and you'll get a tax credit of 119000 roughly. But then on top of that, you could also be looking at the 179B. 
And for 2022, if you were to identify 250,000 square feet of a building or buildings, uh, you could you could see $470,000 of deductions, which at a 30% tax rate is 141,000. I think the the important thing to note here is that between 2022 and 2023, the amount of deductions for 179D jumps. So instead of a dollar 88 in 22, it goes up to potentially five dollars. And then you'll see here if you were, you, you'll see the kind of difference of potential federal tax impact if you don't take the R&D in 179D versus you do. So in 22, it's there'll still be a minor tax, you know, a tax impact of roughly 200,000 in this example, um, but it's not the 460, which is great. And then in 23, you'll actually start to see uh, a reduction of your tax by a negative 137,000. I'll, I'll stop there and see if uh, Kyle or Matt has any other comments about this particular slide. Yeah, no, thanks, Josh. And I think um, the, the point of, you know, kind of us doing this presentation in tandem with Josh was to just show that, you know, hey, there's, you know, these changes to, you know, the Section 41, uh, or the Section 174 expenditures and, you know, that we've, you know, potentially could have been changed, but are now in effect that there's ways to, as I mentioned earlier, there's ways to mitigate that you know, through the Section 41 expenditures um, or with the expansion of Section 179D with the dollar amount. And really that's all we're trying to, to show here is that there's different ways to, to kind of navigate this. And, you know, every taxpayer situation is gonna be a little bit different. There's gonna be some that maybe are taking more uh, section 170, 174 and more 41 and, and maybe a little less 179D or vice versa, but, um, you know, definitely, you know, just good for, I think everybody on this call to be aware of these changes and, you know, to mitigate, uh, that federal tax impact. I think we're, we're getting up close to the, the end of the, the hour. Josh, there was one question uh, that I think hopefully is a quick one for you, but it's, do you have to capitalize yeah. expenses, expenses for amended R&D tax credits? You, you do not have to. Um, so if you decide to amend for 2021 or prior, then you, the capitalization requirement is only effective starting in tax year 2022. So you, a company could go back and claim prior year R and D tax credits without having to capitalize the expense. All right, um, we are unfortunately out of time, so I'm going to go ahead and get us closed out here. Uh, thank you, Kyle, Josh, and Matt, for a great presentation today, and to our audience. Feel free to reach out to our presenters if you have additional questions. Their contact information is in the slide deck as well as in your console. Also, let us know if you would like to set up a separate call to discuss this in more depth uh, by dropping a note in the Q&A window. And if you met all CPE requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. A copy will be emailed within two weeks if you have difficulty downloading it now. And finally, here's a link to an online survey for today's presentation. And thank you for joining us today. Take care, everyone.